Welcome to another Founder Wisdom Pod. We have Jan Michael Hebert with us, aka Ebert. He is a board member at Canadian Psychedelic Association, CEO at Holos Global, and has been a, an independent consultant for retreat center design and development, which is really interesting. We're going to talk about retreats today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, getting to the next level, taking some portals and uh, growth and Michael, uh, Michael, Jan's journey. Uh, I guess I could call you Michael. It's Jan Michael. I am. I am's journey because he's Alaskan, uh, then went to California, uh, French Canadian ancestry, and now lives in Costa Rica. So this podcast is brought to you by podpire.com. Podpire.com is my podcasting agency. If you'd like to start monetize world podcasts, I can get you a bunch of qualified guests. I can get you on podcasts. And I can also help you monetize with YouTube and advertisers slash sponsors uh, that you could get on your pod. So podpire.com for that. It is also brought to you by our friends at Qualia. If you want to optimize your brain, it's a new tropic for busy entrepreneurs. If you want to improve focus, memory, and get more done in a day, you can go to neurohacker.com slash CEO wisdom. Jan, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and what you're up to nowadays. Thank you, Charles. It's great to be on. A um, bit more about myself and what I'm up to. Well, today I was surveying all the trees that we're putting in. We're putting in 4,000 trees over the course of two months. Some of them were reforesting. Some of it is uh, new fruit forests. And just really tending this project down here in Costa Rica. It's a 200-acre development that's a mixed use between conservation community development. So there's 35, 40 lots that people are building houses on. We have a farm and a community zone that'll include a school. And then we have a retreat center that um, has 25 beds and we've been operating for about two and a half years. So just a lot of managing that today and then also dreaming up what could be the next holo site. So we are looking in British Columbia as well as Colorado and prepping for some meetings in Colorado next month. But um, my life dream has really been to be in Costa Rica or Central America and have a farm. I mentioned that I grew up in Alaska to you and um, my ancestors, as you know, come from from uh, Quebec and my direct lineage was apothecaries and, and apple farmers. So there's ways that I'm getting back to my roots and I feel like... Uh, that's something that's really powerful for people is to realize what their lineage is and honor that lineage. And so there's ways that I didn't even know, but this life path that I felt called to is very much in line with what my father's side have been doing for, for centuries. And uh, when I was 17 in Alaska, I decided to become a vegetarian and I realized that Alaska was not the most sustainable place to be a vegetarian. So it's pretty meat eating culture and hunting. And that's what I grew up with. So I set my sights for Central America and started hitchhiking when I was 18 to try to come down and, and have a farm. But I made it as far as midway through Mexico, almost to Oaxaca, where you are now, and discovered waterfalls outside of Puerto Vallarta that I had a very powerful experience behind. And so I I went and lived a lot of lifetimes, had two kids and um, was a contractor, got a master's in psychology. And after all of these life journeys, I finally came to realize this vision of living in Central America. And um, The pandemic really amplified the need for me to be somewhere with more space and in nature. And so I was living in California at the time, but when the borders started closing, I came down to Costa Rica to scout land and and really get to know the community better. And that was a big life shift. So the pandemic, I as hard as it was for a lot of people, um, and there were moments that were challenging, it catalyzed a whole new life for me and this development that we've been that we've been building here. So that's some quick highlights of the journey. Yeah. Very cool. Now the retreats, uh, if we start from a distance, why do people need retreats? 
uh, what constitute a good retreat for someone? How do you set up the right environment? How do you design that? And how do you make people's retreat memorable and most importantly, impactful? That's a, a great number of questions. So um, we'll just start with why do people need retreats? Not everybody needs a retreat, but if you think about like your phone or your computer, occasionally they need a reset and you have to put a new operating system in and it takes a little time for that to download and to, to be activated. And so I find that retreats allow people to take a break from their regular routines and thought patterns and the habituated things that we all do and to have a new perspective. And part of the mission of our retreats is that they're educational. So people learn about other ways of living, but they're also transformational. So we work with plant medicine. We have a license down here to work with psilocybin in San Pedro. Um, we also sometimes have ayahuasca retreats and, uh, we're providing this space for practitioners all around the world to come and offer their gifts. So we have a lot of different modalities and practices that people bring here, um, dance, breath work, yoga, and all of these modalities are what we call holotropic modalities. And holotropic is a word that was coined by Stan Groff, who's one of the founding advisors to Holos and also the inspiration for the project. And holotropic means moving towards wholeness. So, you know, we find that in a seven day container of a retreat that people can really set a new foundation for their lives and come away with some really powerful insights and new ways of being. So, um, yeah, we provide a space that is optimized for people to feel both connected to nature, but also really comfortable and inspired by nature. So when I look for a retreat center site, um, like my work at Esalen, I look for a place where the four elements are really powerful. So, you know, the, the element of earth and the mountains and the element of air, places where there's some open space, the element of water. So here we have six major waterfalls and this really epic river called the Diamante. And from the retreat center, you can see the Diamante waterfall, which is a 600 foot waterfall. It's the biggest waterfall in Costa Rica. And uh, yeah, so, and then the fifth element of the fire, the sun, or we have a fire pit or the kitchen. So when you have those elements, it gives people the different um, textures of life that they can tap into. So if somebody's life is like very lethargic and very like earth and water, maybe they need more fire in their system and they need to be inspired by, by that element. Or if... You know, if people are needing more inspiration, they can turn to the air and the space and the vision and the view. So I look for a place that has those elements because it provides a real grounding for the work. And um, yeah, we also build structures. The human environment is really important. So we build structures that are really inspiring. We have these bamboo structures with big arches and a temple and a dining hall that are just exquisitely built, kind of inspired by some of the architecture that's happening in Bali or Tulum. And yeah, so those are some pieces that we put together that I would say our specialty is, is crafting the right space. And then a space that has a narrative that's tied into the landscape. And that landscape includes all the different layers of history of human habitation. So we do a lot to honor, honor the ancestors in the land, the indigenous people that were here before and um, so we've had a lot of tribal gatherings here where indigenous people can come learn things and share their offerings and also connecting the tribal elders from around Costa Rica. So there's a lot of things that we do to create an environment with that's very rich in meaning and purpose and gives people an opportunity to tap into that and then find purpose and meaning in their own lives. Love that. What's special to you about waterfalls? I understand the water element water is really important for me the ocean uh the yeah. sand and to ground myself and also to be more fluid like bruce lee would say uh but waterfalls mm -hmm. um, what what is so mystical about uh these waterfalls and also tell me about the wooden architecture uh, it seems yeah. to always fascinate me when i go on these ayahuasca trips just to watch the ceiling and and oh. yeah what, what is it about these patterns so two questions yeah you 
you would be so blown away by the structures here. You actually, you saying that, you just have to make a trip down at some point. But uh, we built these big bamboo structures and um, I was a carpenter in Alaska, but we built with a lot of square corners. And so here I've really gotten to experiment with how do you build with circles and arches and there's a way that you can heat bamboo and then it creates a opportunity to bend it and then it holds that that shape. So we built these massive bamboo structures kind of inspired by the design of a honeycomb. So they're all six six sided shapes with these big arches. And then the ceilings are around a, a pattern of the flower of life. So it's like these diamonds and or hexagonal and triangular equilateral triangle shapes. And it creates this unbelievable texture. And so you speaking about ayahuasca and like everybody comes in there and they're like, oh my gosh, all night I was just hypnotized by the magic of this architecture, totally just being held in this dome that's made of the the geometry of what they call the flower of life or the, the re repetition of the seed of life, which is basically six circles um, that form equilateral triangles. So yeah, we played a lot with the architecture. It was really fun for me to learn a new art and then also to surrender to the imperfections because working with bamboo, it's not like you're working with straight um, sticks, you know, so that's been really, really fun. And um, the waterfall question, when I was 18, this re restaurant owner in Puerto Vallarta encouraged me to go to this little town, Yalapa, and go up into the waterfalls. So I went on this journey up into the waterfalls and I found this waterfall where I could perfectly fit my body behind it. And it created this little chamber and it was like being in a spacecraft and the, the water um, was looking right out at the sun and, and the sun created these like hypnotic patterns through the water. And I started singing. I started like toning, creating these like primal tones and some of the tones would reflect off the water in a particular way that it would reflect into the chamber and like build what they call a constructive vibration. So the chamber started to like vibrate to the extent that my body totally dissolved. And I just became like a primal son of, of consciousness. And I could feel that consciousness and the way that the whole universe is an expression of this primal light and sound. So that was kind of what hooked me on waterfalls originally. Um, I also, we had a family cabin in Denali National Park where the tallest mountain in North America is, and we were next to a river and, and waterfalls. And so I always had this like feeling of connection to the water, but moving here and discovering the waterfalls that we have on the land and the Diamante Falls, I started to learn that the, the water actually has a lot of intelligence more than I understood. There's like the work of Dr. Emoto that water actually carries energy and it's something that can be observable and can be um, to an extent measured. But I started listening to the textures of the water, whether it's a little creek or a raging river. And I realized that the water is actually like a living entity that has all of these different ways of expressing itself. And so I've, I've deepened my relationship with this river here and these waterfalls to the extent that it's like they're they're a teacher for me. So yeah, it's been quite a journey and I continue to learn a lot from the water. That's fascinating. Now your ancestors, um, like my ancestors, I have salesmen in there, my direct grandfather, I have politician. Um, I, I choose to view politics in a good way you know it's like being a leader and influencing change although like most politicians nowadays are not doing that arguably but yeah they're uh, I, I guess leaders and influencers quote-unquote not in not in the modern sense of the word but mostly like leading people towards one positive direction how much of that should someone uh try to embody vs when is it a good moment to break your lineage and start anew? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, there's when you do ancestry work, they talk about like the the ancestors that are healthy ancestors and the ones that maybe need healing. And the encouragement in that work is to first focus on the healthy lines and like really honor those and appreciate those. And then you can start working on the ones that are less healthy. But, you know, a lot of us, 
come from lineages of of work or vocation that may not be relevant to our lives today or may not even be you know like uh jobs in the future things are changing really fast so i think adaptation is one of the primary qualities of life and it's kind of up to us to source in our spirit and figure out is there something from our lineage that we want to bring with us and skills and qualities that we can emulate and then are there things that we really want to let go and we can become very conscious of like oh yeah there's patterns here that i've absorbed from my lineage there's intergenerational traumas or ways of thinking that don't serve me anymore and so you can look at them and then set them down and discover what is the unique expression that you have to bring to the world you know it's like um it's like in the plant species when you when you have two plants that you you co-mingle and you mix there may be a third hybrid that that uh, emerges out of it and so we're all hybrids and the expression of our unique gifts is really is really up to us to discover so yeah now the experiences that you organize how do you make them very memorable how do you make sure that people enter um the environment in a comfortable and calm state of mind and that they get out um with what they wanted out of that trip uh, is there a way to design uh, an impactful experience yeah having strong facilitators that really help provide that that connection to people um is is one of the primary things then there's of course the built environment and the different things that you can do in hospitality to give people a sense of really being cared for food really makes a big difference to people like if they're inspired by the food and feel like nourished and that their particular dietary needs that provides a sense of safety it's like once you provide the initial it's like in maslow's hierarchy of needs when you provide like food water shelter get that really good and people start to feel more at home then another component that's really important is for people to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of community so most of the work that we do is all in a group context like groups of 12 to 24 and so that is i think where a lot of the alchemy happens it's like someone is having a particular experience and it may be challenging um, and they share about that experience or other people are able to witness it. And oftentimes that triggers for, for someone um, their own healing or, or their own access point to something that they need to learn or, or develop. And then of course we do significant preparation and integration for people. So depending on whether they've how, where they're at on their journey, different people need different levels of what we call psychoeducation. So understanding about plant medicine, understanding about transformation, understanding about the brain. And then primarily for our integration, um, we do group work. So group Zoom calls and just helping people to reintegrate into their lives what they've learned here. Um, and that's the biggest that's the biggest thing for people is they have these really high peak experiences here and um, expand into a, into a more sensitive space. And then oftentimes going back to their lives is a pretty big adjustment and their relationships and their work and their ways of being in the world um, may be different. So, yeah, that's that's a big part of the arc. Oh, where, what's the state of legality throughout the world of doing that? For example, I'm, uh, I'm doing yearly uh, trips with my friends in Canada and just like marijuana back then, you know, it's like, yeah, it's going to be legalized one day in Canada. Mexico, I mean, yeah, the police here is not really policing, which is good in my opinion. Uh, they give mm -hmm. you space, but it's still illegal to do stuff like peyote and, and all of that. So uh, what's the state of uh, legality in Costa Rica and places like uh, U.S., Mexico, and Canada? Yeah, yeah, North and Central America um, have very unique jurisdictions. So Costa Rica, we have an alternative health clinic license. Um, there's a few others in Costa Rica. Most people are operating under the radar. Um, and it seems like the Costa Rican government only intervenes if there's an issue, if there's like a complaint. So if somebody has a negative experience in an ayahuasca retreat, or at one point there was a lot more iboga clinics in Costa Rica, and I think there were a few deaths. And so the, the government started to track that. Um, similarly in Mexico, I know a lot of people that work with 
ibogaine or other types of plant medicines. And in most of these Latin American countries, it's it's gray area still. There's not like specific legislation that allows you to do things. Sometimes you can do things in Mexico in a religious context, especially with plant medicine. Um, but it really is nuanced per location and also whether the local authorities want to give you a hard time. Um, in the U.S. and Canada, it's mostly things that are working under the church model that are actually getting legal approval. So like Santo Daime in the U.S. or Canada, um, there's the Native American church that works with peyote in the U.S. And so I would say that's the, the model that has primarily been used. But now, as a lot of people know, Oregon has uh, psilocybin laws that allow them to work with psilocybin. Um, Colorado's working on a natural medicine act, which will allow the use of different um, natural medicines and psychedelics. And it's similar to, to cannabis, where the individual states are starting to craft their own laws or individual cities are decriminalizing medicine and not putting any kind of um, police force attention on it. But at a federal level, there's still a lot of these medicines are illegal. So you can get in trouble with the federal government, just like you could with cannabis. And those things are slowly changing. So it's like slow. It's like a very slow moving wave. And I feel like some people jump on the wave and they're like, oh, this is going to go so fast. And a lot of companies like bank on, oh, yeah, this is going to be a big industry immediately. And I I think to the contrary, that it's those that are like, riding the longboard that are on the big wave that are like, okay, we're going to ride this for a long time and just be steady and patient. Those are the ones that ultimately are going to survive in the industry. So yeah. And in Canada, there's, um, there's definitely openings and similar to cannabis in Vancouver, there's, you know, technically illegal mushroom shops that have opened up. And I just kind of feel like that's the sign of the times. It's like there's pioneers that are willing to put themselves out there. But psychedelics are a little bit different than cannabis in that they require more care and more holding and that people have like a guide and support a lot of the time. So there's a lot of people that are in this field that feel that there should be um, there should be laws set up that allow for the medicalization or for decriminalization in a way that allows people to stay psychologically safe and smart about how they work with these medicines. That makes a lot of sense. Yan, where can people find out more about you? You can go to holos.global, either um, you know through an internet search or on Instagram. We're also holos.global.